Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Christian theology was the touchstone for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s political ideology. But King's Christianity was neither narrow nor exclusive. It found common purpose throughout the world, most critically with Mahatma Gandhi, the anti colonial activist and philosopher who led India to independence from Great Britain through non violent direct action protest. After his 1959 trip to India, 11 years after Gandhi's assassination, and 54 years ago this month, Dr. King wrote in the essay, My Trip to the Land of Gandhi, we were looked upon as brothers, with the color of our skins as something of an asset. But the strongest bond of fraternity was the common cause of minority and colonial peoples in America, Africa, and Asia, struggling to throw off racialism and imperialism. But it wasn't just a feeling of brotherhood and unified objective. Dr. King experienced a real sense of purpose and strategy. Here's another passage from the essay. The trip had a great impact on me personally. It was wonderful to be in Gandhi's land, to talk with his son, his grandsons, his cousin, and other relatives. I left India more convinced than ever before that nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. Joining now to talk about this different type of black-brown coalition is Khalil Jabral Mohammed, director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, also Matt Welch, editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, Anthea Butler, religious studies professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and Rajiv Mahatra, who is the founder of Infinity Foundation. And the last time that you were here, told me that you were working on a book on exactly this topic of how African-American history and and the story of India relate and interconnect with one another. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you know, Gandhi started his struggle in South Africa. Yep. He was based in South Africa. And his whole model was a Hindu model, and Martin Luther King's model was a Christian model, but both of them converged on the idea of nonviolence to resist against oppression. So one of, the, one of the interesting questions is, what if this were applied today in the struggles today which have turned violent? Mm -hmm. What if nonviolence were used rather than violence today? In their respective struggles also, there were so many factions and so many pressures from other groups to make violence the method. And these two men were great enough to resist that. So I think there's a lesson from their common history. And also the African-American experience in this country mm -hmm. has been very important in the, in the creation of non-white identities mm -hmm. as a kind of a opening door for others. The civil rights movement led to others be, uh, being able to migrate because the Immigration Act mm -hmm. followed soon after the Civil Rights Act, yeah. which is why most Indian Americans like me are able to come here to this country. So uh, while the African Americans have very successfully created a new identity, mm -hmm. a positive identity, and not sort of confused about are we white or not white, but we are positive as to who we are, I think Indian Americans are still new in this country and haven't mm -hmm. done that. And there's still the Bobby Jindal syndrome which says, well, I'd rather be white. Mm -hmm. And then there is the other type who says, well, if I have enough money and I've made it materially, then I don't need to worry about these issues. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the real project of being being distinct and being American at the same time in a multicultural setup is something that Indian Americans have yet to start in, in a serious way. You know, the, as I was sort of reading it and trying to think through this, Khalil, I was just once again so struck by how many interconnections there are. You, you bring up the fact um, that Gandhi was in South Africa, but not just that, but it was a train case. It was being thrown off of a, a form of, of public transportation, which is, of course, also at the core of both the Plessy v. Ferguson case here in this country, which determined and separate but equal, but also, of course, Rosa Parks yes. and the Montgomery bus boycott that ultimately brought Dr. King to the fore as a, as a civil rights leader. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that in the world that was defined by colonialism in the early 20th century, black and brown people didn't have to read each other's works to come to a common understanding that their humanity was being oppressed and that it took certain moments, contexts, individuals to 
muster the courage not just to learn from examples around the world, uh, but also to test those ideas. And so even before King, uh, James Farmer and mm -hmm. Bayard Rustin had studied Gandhi's efforts in, in South Africa and later in India, and were actually King's tutors yeah. on this issue because they had started those efforts through CORE in the North as early freedom fighters testing desegregation or really expanding integration outside of the South long before it became known as the Southern Civil Rights Movement. So that just to me demonstrates how long the uh, effort for anti-colonialism had been unfolding over the course of the 20th century since we know it begins in the late 19th century. No, it's interesting. So we have, we have the deep history. We have this potential of sort of continuing uh, engagement. This president, President Obama, part of what I found so fascinating and continue to find fascinating about him is the extent to which he is truly a cosmopolitan citizen of the world. Chicago may be home, but he has all of these other things. His first state dinner here in the U.S. was with India. And in fact, we also know that he and the First Lady traveled to New Delhi and were there. There, there continues to be this possibility of developing this understanding of both anti-racism and anti-colonialism or anti-imperialism. How do we build that more international, cosmopolitan way of imagining our struggles? Well, I, I think on this side in America, it's, it's helping our students sort of realize that this history is there. I'm, I'm teaching Martin and Malcolm in America right now, and we just got through this whole piece on Satyagraha and all how this is in Martin Luther King's thinking. I think that people tend to see that there's like this, they see a separation, but I, what I want them to see is this togetherness because now going forward, these same movements are happening, whether we're talking about Tibetan monks or mm -hmm. others talking about non violence, how these movements have progressed and these same principles of Gandhiism have gone forward. What we do need to just focus in on now, that there's another way to do this and that way is nonviolent mm -hmm. protest. And I think that's the that's the important piece, especially in America because I think we think about protest as having some violent component to it. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference. It, it seems to me also, Matt, that there's an interesting narrative be, uh, with these men that connects back to our earlier conversation about personal responsibility. Because they were also both men who thought a great deal about their personal individual life choices, but but in a more political way rather than this sort of narrow um, uh, amorality. If you go back to the letter from Birmingham jail, which is you know, one of our great American documents, and it's, a, it's really a blueprint that people have used all around the world uh, uh, ever since, including fighting uh, uh, communism uh, in, in the 1980s. Um, talks about the four necessary preconditions to civil disobedience and two of them that are uh, underrated or under uh, looked at I think are self purification which I think he probably takes directly from Gandhi on yeah. some level um, where you really have to say that I am I am you know uh, I'm driving all impure thoughts from my mind and motivations and I'm gonna become pure but it's also the gathering of the facts mm. right I am going to not just try to find the person on the other side who's a monster. I'm not just going to go against Bull Connor. I'm going to go against the accommodationist, hmm. uh, you know, white preachers there who are saying you're going a little bit too fast, right? right. So go out there and, and, and engage with that and get the facts totally on your side, and then it's going to give you a certain moral authority going forward. And people have picked up on that all around the world. We see it today in the Arab world. The Arab That's Spring true. picked up on a lot of the same currents of, of the yeah. charter revolution move, movements uh -huh. in the 80s, which were direct descended from civil rights and on from Gandhi it's a really amazingly powerful kind mm -hmm. of mode so of he, operation. he said be the change you want to see in others mm -hmm. yes right. so be the change so you have to start with yourself yeah and that's the purification part of what you what you just mentioned Chief. I think another aspect which we shouldn't forget is besides the civil disobedience from a political level there was also this decolonizing the intellectual epistemology mm -hmm. Gandhi wrote his a, a book called Hind Faraj which means the liberation the freedom of his nation a yep. hundred years ago uh, in, uh, in 1909 or so and that was his blueprint critiquing British system of thought yep. British paradigm framework and he was accusing his countrymen who were becoming soldiers for the British Army mm -hmm. and civil servants for the British Empire and they were the ones who were firing bullets and and enforcing all the British laws against Indians so this is also an intellectual revolt that's right. In, in, in popular culture, we like to say, free your mind, your behind will follow. Stay right there. We're going to stay on exactly this issue of how the struggle continues and how we all can be part of making progress.
Melissa, congratulations on your one year of Nerdland. Love being on the show. Love getting a chance to host the show. And by the way, I'm also a fan. Most Harris Perry show is on the weekly DVR at the Reed household alongside Scandal and The Walking Dead and Downton Abbey. That's high praise. And LL also says congratulations.